Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about troubleshooting Cloud Stack, Apache Cloud Stack environments. My name is Kirk Kaczynski. I'm an escalation engineer at Citrix Systems. I'm also Apache Cloud Stack committer. So here's the agenda for troubleshooting. I'm going to cover two key areas, the network troubleshooting and log analysis. Now these are two areas that I find are really the most important, or the most common uh, pain points for troubleshooting environments. And you may be wondering why I say Apache Cloud Stack environments. Well, you're basically not really going to be troubleshooting that much, that many issues that are purely Cloud Stack issues that are completely self-contained within Cloud Stack. Primarily, you're going to have something that has something to do with the environment. Doesn't mean necessarily you're going to have issues that's caused by the environment, but you know, most likely that's a very high possibility. But uh, there's going to be a lot of troubleshooting that you have to do that maybe it's caused by Cloud Stack, but you're going to have to do something in the environment itself. So network troubleshooting. So probably within network troubleshooting, the most common problem I see is VLAN problems. There's just, I don't know what, the, what it is about VLANs, but they're just, I guess they're just hard. <laughs> they're just hard to deal with. Uh, you, you have, the symptoms range is like VMs can't get DHCP, or VMs can't uh, ping each other, or maybe they can ping each other when they're on the same host, but they can't ping each other when they're on different hosts. And these are all indicative of VLAN problems. And so what you want to try to find out is where this traffic is actually getting lost. Usually it will actually get past the host. It will be going off the host into the physical switches. And then it's disappearing somewhere. So if the hosts, you know, for example, if the traffic is going between two hosts and they are connected to the same switch, then maybe one of the hosts is connected to the, a switch port that's in trunk mode or not in trunk mode, it's in uh, access mode, right? That would be a big problem because it's not passing any VLAN information. Another one could be uh, the different switches have different uh, concepts of allowing, uh, allowing uh, the VLANs or allowing them by default or not, right? Some, some switches will default even within the same manufacturer too. So you really, we have to check the switch documentation. You know, within a particular model and even like firmware version of a switch, it might be, it might allow, like if you turn on a trunk port, it might allow all switches, all uh, VLANs by default, but it might also deny them by default. So you have to check the documentation to see if you need to go in and explicitly set allowing particular VLANs or not. And so the, the troubleshooting would typically involve, like if you're using Zen Server KVM, it's kind of easy. You can use TC dump on the host level and just listen on the different different levels of the network, right? You can listen on a bridge or the virtual interface or the physical interface, that kind of thing. Uh, Zen, ser or Zen server with uh, OpenV switch may be a little bit harder. Same with uh, VMware. You might need to like, set up some kind of span ports or dummy VMs some way so you can try to f isolate where that, uh, that uh, traffic is being dropped. And probably most common is just some kind of switch misconfiguration. So just check the switch, check the documentation, you know, make sure the host is plugged into the right switch port, that kind of thing. Uh, it can, and you, know, you can also have other weird problems like uh, cabling or something. And then for shared networks, since it's a, the physical router that's handling the traffic instead of the cloud stack managed virtual router, then you can basically have some kind of configuration problem on the router itself. So I've seen problems where router is just dropping, not listening on certain VLANs, for example. Um, and I've seen cases where uh, there was like, a, uh, like a active active switches like with some kind of like uh, load balancing between, uh, the, between the, uh, the routers. And some of them, one of them was broken or something. Some, one of them is just not, not uh, handling certain VLANs. So this is a quite, it can be quite complicated. So it's just up to the switch, uh, up to the, the hardware being uh, very uh, troublesome at sometimes. Uh, going, continuing with VLANs, there's more, uh, more possible problems besides the physical switch. You can also have uh, problems at the hypervisor level. So a big one is NIC drivers. Uh, I don't know, like the people selling the server NICs, sometimes they don't expect you to install them in servers. They just, you know, they test it on their, on their, uh, on their you know, their desktop on their machine and it works with, without VLANs, so it should work with VLANs, right? Well, 
you know, doesn't actually, doesn't actually translate to, uh, to necessarily working with VLANs. So might, might, might you know, check the NIC drivers and update them, update the Linux kernel, if, or check with the hypervisor vendor if they have some uh, recommendations on NIC driver versions. Bonding is improved, uh, but it can be just adds another NIC. You know, every, every, it's just, you know, however many NICs you add in bonding is just how much more trouble you can have. So you might have multiple NICs supposedly, supposedly working in concert, but in reality they not actually working in concert, so they might, you might have uh, some NICs that's uh, connected to the right switch part that's configured correctly, and some are not. So you have to really be very, very careful with bonding. And uh, definitely follow the hypervisor vendor recommendations. And there's some tricks with CloudStack. You might need to check the CloudStack documentation and make sure that bonding is set up really correctly and um, really working right. And it can be tough because you can have active passive bonding, for example, and well, you know, you set it up and it works because that active NIC's fine, but then you know that NIC goes away at some point and the passive NIC doesn't work anymore. So that's that's bad. So you would want to do some like manual failover to test. Do you have a question? Yeah, bonding to UIP have you seen the uh, cloud stack layer issue? Or is it a hypervisor issue that's question is, is the issues with CloudStack or with the hypervisor? I'd say mostly with hypervisor. Uh, it depends on how you're configuring the hypervisors. I mean, CloudStack can do some stuff with bonding configuration. Uh, so you, that's why you, know, you should check the CloudStack documentation and follow the recommendations. And another one I've seen was database hacking causing VLAN problems. You think, well, why, what's going on with database hacking? Well, sometimes people configure something incorrectly at first, and then they say, well, I need this v v VLAN 100 to 200, but I configured it to VLAN 100 to 150. So what they do, they go you know, look in MySQL and say, oh, here we go, this is the right table, and they update it, and then it changes in the UI. It says the right range, but that, was, that table is just for the UI. <laughs> it's not actually being used for, for configuring the actual VLAN. So they, they wonder why their UI says, 100 to 150, and then the actual VLAN is being 180, right? Well, you didn't hack the right tables, basically. So I would say try not to hack the database that much. Uh, you know, definitely plan ahead and make sure it's using the right VLAN range ahead of time. So besides VLANs, another possible uh, issue I've seen with networking is security groups. and well, with KVM and Zen Server, um, you can have things like VMs are inaccessible in one direction or another. Basically, like a security group you've configured is, you know, maybe it's not being applied. Uh, another thing you have to make sure that security groups actually enabled because you can create a basic zone with no security groups. Right? You don't have to enable security groups, so then you might be wondering why they don't working. So <laughs> you want to make sure that you enable security groups first and. Uh, you know, do that. And uh, with vSphere, if you're using security groups, I have bad news for you, this doesn't work at all. It's not supported. So um, that, if you're surprised about it not working and using vSphere, then there you go, it's not supported. Uh, so actually with troubleshooting it, you can, you can with KVM and Xen server, you can check IP tables and EB tables on the host itself, because basically the security groups are just handled through these basically firewall rules on the host level. And since it's at the host level, you might find that there's a problem with one host, and then you could actually live migrate a VM to another host, and it works there. So you could kind of do some troubleshooting with there with just using live migration. Uh, with Zen Server, you want to make sure you're using bridge mode for, the, for all the hosts in the cluster that's uh, using security groups, because uh, that's the requirement. Because the default now is open vSwitch and doesn't work with uh, security groups. Uh, with Zen Server especially, I like this one, make go fast now, .sh. Don't run that. If you have that for your environment and you log in and to your Zen Server and you say, oh, geez, this looks like CentOS. I'm just going to point my chef or whatever at it and flip, you know, I'll apply all my optimizations, right, and cause problems. Basically, it's not just because there's, you, you can log in with the root and there's a Linux.com for sysctl.conf uh, and you can edit them and the changes take effect doesn't mean it's going to work right. So you know, be very, very careful, I would say. Just 
I would say just don't touch that at all, ever. But uh, you know, if you have to, then you know, be careful. So host connectivity is another really big issue with networking, and I would just say there's, you should check the cloud stack documentation. So hosts and cloud stack, if you're not aware, is hypervisors. Like the, you might think of a host as a hypervisor only, but in cloud stack also considers system VMs and secondary storage as hosts. And there's a whole lot of uh, connectivity uh, requirements for these, for these hosts. Uh, one thing that's not a host is a virtual router, so that's not considered a host, but even that has connectivity uh, requirements. So just, just be very, very careful about, uh, about what, uh, what ports are open and what services are allowed and that kind of thing. And you know, going back to my, you know, the, the shell script from the previous slide, if you're, you know, like for with a Zen server, you, know, you're, you might be used to, for example, on your other CentOS machines, you disable root log on, right? Because that's more secure, right? But, but maybe it doesn't, doesn't actually work in Zen server. It causes problems, so. And the cause, cause of problems with cloud stack. That's just an example. And so my slides, when I upload them, they have notes, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, tips on there about the specifics. But it, you know, it's really just in the documentation. You really want to make sure to check the cloud stack documentation, and you know, especially if you're in a really highly secure environment where things are basically denied by default, and you have to open firewall ports, then you really, really have to be careful because those are the environments I see people running into all kinds of problems because. You know, they, they, don't, they don't account for certain, certain directions of the traffic flow and then you know, some problem happens and it's just because some port's closed or something. So virtual router, well, if you're not familiar with the virtual router, it depends, depending on the type of network, it does different things. Uh, but for pretty much any, well, and also depends on the network offering, right? Because you can, you can disable some, certain services and basically, not, you could even just not use a virtual router at all if you disable everything. But, uh, but generally, it's going to provide a DHCP and DNS for the VMs in the network. And that's done through DNS mask. So if you're having a pro that kind of problem and you've ruled out one of the previous issues with like VLANs or something, then you can g log in there and check if DNS mask is running, for example. Uh, also, there's HA proxy running, and that's doing load balancing. Uh, another thing that the virtual router is generally doing is password resets, and that is done, um, there's basically two pieces that can go wrong there. On the client side, it's usually, it kind of seems like mainly the client side is where it goes wrong. Basically, there's a script that runs and it gets the new password, basically just like downloading, like W getting the password, practically. Uh, I think it might be using curl, but it, it's up to the script. But uh, it's just downloading this new password from the virtual router and Sometimes the script doesn't work for some reason. Like if uh, the script is, uh, I think people have really worked on the script lately, so there's not as many problems. But uh, just make sure the script is running. There's, it just logs to like var log messages or, or, uh, or whatever the default is for the OS. Um, I think for Windows, there's, there's a log file in the installation directory of the, uh, of the script. And there can also be server problems. Um, surprising, I don't actually see that much. It seems, seems like so thrown together, or not, 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 not thrown together, but like, like a duct tape thing. You got a SOCAT process running there and running a script, just listening and runs a script as necessary. And doesn't actually have that many problems, I guess, but uh, um, you can log in there and make sure there's a SOCAT process listening on 8080. And if there isn't, well, that's probably gonna be a problem. And another thing virtual router is doing is user and metadata, and that's just using a Apache web server running on there and just in the standard, uh, Standard path there, so you can. So if your if your VMs are not getting that for some reason, then you can log in there and make sure it exists. And you know, usually with any of these problems, you can stop and start virtual router and solve it, or or um, just destroy it and recreate it, or restart the network. That kind of thing will solve it. So templates are another network problem. You can basically have when you create your templates, it might work great, and then you or when you're creating a template, it works fine. And then you Create, you, you, you clone it to a template, and then it doesn't work anymore when you boot it up. And you know, that's one of the co common problems is the NIC is uh, changing, um, changing the name of the NIC. You know, it might be ETH0 when you create a template, but then when someone spins it up with a new MAC address, it's ETH1 or some crazy, um, crazy you know, not, not name and number, it's weird. So just be careful with that and check like UDEV rules and stuff, clear, clear any UDEV uh, uh, like cache or whatever. And Windows has a nice thing called sysprep, 
I think there's some sysprep-like tools on Linux that you can use. And one tip I like to do when I'm creating templates, I just don't create them in CloudStack usually. I just create them on like my desktop or some standalone server and get it all nice and stuff, and then I will import it to CloudStack. And sometimes that's required. Like with Ubuntu, you can't really create it on a Zen server through CloudStack, not in PV mode at least, because uh, it doesn't support network install. So just have to do that outside of CloudStack. All right, so I'm going to get going on to log analysis. Basically, when you have any kind of problems in CloudStack, if you're the end user or using API or something, you're going to get some kind of error message that's completely useless. It's going to say failure or something just tells you nothing, basically. So, so how do you actually solve any kind of problems? Well, I'm going to get, go, go, try to go over some tips and try to get to some examples. So first of all, obviously, the log files are going to matter. And there's log files all over. <laughs> but the ones that you're going, to, you're going to mainly be talking about are the management server logs. And that's the path. And there's two log, well, there's really one log that you need to care about. It's the management server.log. That's basically 99.9% .9 of the things you're going to need to look at that for any kind of problem. There's the API log.log. And uh, sometimes that will be helpful. That captures the API commands that was sent to CloudStack by the end user. And there's some other logs that's you know, more or less not really useful. There's Catalina.out, and I think that's only useful if you're a developer, because you can create a thread dump and it'll be saved there. But as an administrator, you're probably not going to look at thread dumps. And there's the access underscore log, and that kind of like captures IP addresses of people accessing the, the server, so you can maybe find out who did something that blew everything up and go fire them or something. Uh, but besides that, there's a bunch of other logs that's just not useful. Or maybe they're useful and I don't know about it, but I haven't seen any use of them. So besides the management server, there's hypervisors that have logs. And uh, you know, there depends on the hypervisor. So Zen server, there's varlog sm log and zen source style log. So sm log is the storage manager log, but that's where CloudStack puts everything. Uh, now, that will be any kind of CloudStack failure that at the host level will be an SM log, probably. Now, if there's something that the hypervisor did as a result of those uh, CloudStack act or, uh, uh, instructions, then it might be in Zen source style log. Or like if there's some kind of like corrupted files or something, then maybe it'll be showing up in Zen source style log. KVM, there's several. There's the agent dialog for CloudStack agent. And uh, by default, it's useless. But uh, that's because this debug is dis disabled on it. So you get info level logs, which don't help you troubleshoot at all. So you need to go in there and enable debug. And I saw in one of the other presentations that was someone just part of their like, deployment script just enabled debug on them. So that's, that's a good idea. And there's also libvert dialog, libvert d dialog. And that's, that'll be useful because obviously the agent talks to libvert and does everything through libvert. So uh, if there's any problems in libvert, it'll show up there probably. And sometimes libvert will throw things into varlog messages. So you know, check there too. And vSphere, um, I would just log on to vCenter and just check out, check out what's going on there. There's a vmware.log on the actual hosts, but I never really, don't usually look at that. Usually you can, you can find out the problem from checking out uh, vCenter. So when you have a problem that you need to troubleshoot, um, really depends on the environment. If you're a developer and you just have like one host and using your dev cloud, then you, know, you probably don't need most of this. But uh, if you have like a real production environment and you know, the type of environments I typically see maybe have the management server dialog is like five gigabytes a day. So how do you find anything in five gigabytes of text? It's, it's difficult. So ideally you want to have some kind of, well, the, the ideal obviously is the job ID. You want a job ID from the API or UI or the database, because that will be logged in the log. Um, if, that, if that doesn't, you don't have that, then you can look for the uh, UI, uh, the error text from the UI or the API. Basically, those, those errors that they give you are useless for doing anything by in and of itself. But if you have that error and you have the management server.log, you can go find that error and look in the log to find the real problem. 
Um, if you don't have that, at least you might, might want to have the uh, VM name of there was some kind of problem with the VM starting, for, for example, then it would be good to have that name. Uh, it's just up to the end users what they're going to tell you. If you're, if you're the administrator, hopefully the end user will give you something useful to work with. Uh, uh, they might say, like, uh, they couldn't delete a VM, and then you can at least have that. And they don't know which VM they tried to delete, but, you know, you have their account, you can check the database or something and go from there. If you don't have any of that, <laughs> then you can look for the uh, keywords, like warn error exception, enable failed. Uh, if you know that a, someone did an action and failed, you can s search for submit async. Uh, that will be like they're submitting a job. That will show up in the manager server dialog. Um, you know, besides that, you can also look for hypervisor errors. Basically, if there's an error at the hypervisor level, Basically, some part of that thing is going to work its way into the management server dialog. So with Zen server, you're going to have something like SR backend failure. With the KVM, you might have something libvert, libvert exception, pretty much anything like libvert. You're going to be some kind of hypervisor problem on KVM. Uh, vSphere, you're going to just look for mainly like exceptions that have uh, VMware in the, in the name. Um, So besides that, once you, once you maybe find some kind of, uh, uh, once you find like kind of like just something to start with, like you have the job ID and you're going through the, the job that failed, uh, some things you might need to do will be enable trace logging. Uh, sometimes that's helpful to find, like mainly, the thing I see it mainly useful would be for uh, looking at the SQL queries that maybe failed, for example. Mm, one thing to watch out for is the, it's, uh, this, in quotes there, the forwarding seek. That's forwarding sequence. That's when a sequence is forwarded from one management server to another. So basically, the management, one management server is handling it, and then you have another management server, and it's, the sequence is now going to go over there and run over there. And so obviously, that's a problem if you uh, need to find out what happened to that sequence. You need to log on to their server and find it. And the sequence ID will be the same, that's good. So then you just find it there and follow it there and probably it will forward it back to the original one when, uh, when it finishes or fails. Uh, one thing to watch out for is uh, errors about avoid set. I hate this thing, but uh, you know, I, it's, it's hard to blame anybody for being, you know, seeing that and wondering about it. Basically, avoid set is actually meaningless. It doesn't, mean, doesn't tell you anything other than there was an error earlier in the job. So if you see avoid set, it means basically you need to scroll up in the log to find out what the real problem is. And so uh, avoid set is per, per job. It's a very temporary state. So something happens, some, someone tries a job, someone tries to do something, and then it fails, and then it, those, those uh, resources are put into a void set, and then uh, the job completes, basically. So, um, so what you really, if you see the avoid set, you need to just, like, just scroll up a little bit and find the real problem. Now, if you have a lot of activity in the environment, um, you might have a lot of <coughs> errors going on, and you, know, you might wonder if there's, you find the, the error you're concerned about, but then like one line above there is another error that, you know, is that related or not? Well, probably not. You know, you have to find some, something to connect them, you know, like a job ID or a sequence ID or, or something, you know, just being next to each other in the log doesn't tell you anything. And you know, once you, once you have enough information, you just basically just follow the job and follow the sequence. Uh, I think I'll have enough time to go over at least an example to show this. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, you can do trace, you can enable trace logging, and I think that's in the documentation or somewhere. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to enable. And like in this one, you can see the SQL query that uh, we were wanted to look at. And jobs and sequences. This is uh, this is from 4.2. Cloud Stack 4.2, and you can see that this submit async right there, that's one of the keywords I told you about, and then there's this job-114, and that's uh, the numerical job ID, and then equals this ABDE thing, and that's the, the UUID form of the job ID. So this thing, this UUID, would actually be showing up in the API uh, response, so you could check that with Firebug, or if you're using API directly, you would see it probably. Uh, and then you can continue looking at this job. I mean, this, this thing there, they're destroying a VM. And I think this might have changed actually in 4.3, so now I, I'm not sure, but it seems I checked out 4.3 recently and didn't have this anymore, so 
maybe we're back to the old days where, where there was, it was harder to find the job ID. So possible solutions, it really just depends on the problem. You're gonna, it could be a common thing, it be capacity problems. Uh, you know, obviously check the network like I had mentioned. Um, you know, obviously it kind of depends on the errors you find in the log, right? So if you see like errors like no route to host, connection refused, then there might be something going on with the network. Or like unable to mount secondary storage or something, then it could be network or it could be the storage. Uh, one solution is just wait. You know, sometimes jobs just take time and you need to wait a few minutes for them to finish. Uh, and if you're not patient, then you hack the database and try again. And you know, sometimes that helps and sometimes it accomplishes nothing, just a waste. So let's go over an example. So in this case, we, the end user sent us a screenshot of the, uh, of the error from the UI. And the very characteristic Klausak uh, error just tells you nothing, just fails. So what you want to do is go to the management server dialog and you can see, well, there's this error, the unable to create deployment. So you now have the job ID, job 1726. So then you continue looking, scrolling up in the log and, oh, geez, it's in a voice set. You know, what's this? What, why is it in a voice set? Well, you need to scroll up to find out why. Because, like I said, a voice set it is not, not a problem, actually, by itself. And uh, this other area, could not find a suitable deployment destination for this VM under any clusters. So that's kind of getting you there. But, like, why didn't it find a suitable deployment destination? Well, keep looking. And so if you go through all the way, you can see that uh, it found the host 17 had enough capacity for the CPU of 2300 megahertz. And it has enough CPU, yeah, it has enough capacity. But then you can see it has enough capacity, but doesn't have CPU capability. And what CloudStack is trying to say in its own way, that uh, the host doesn't have the CPU, 2300 megahertz CPU to assign to a VM. So this host had like 2,200 megahertz, and if you're using a service offering that's 2,300, it's going to fail. And you know, the way, it's, the way they tell you is host has CPU capability, false. So that's, that's not that you not, doesn't really tell you that much, but you know, I guess uh, you have to know what to look for. So one thing about exceptions, it's good, I guess, if you're a developer, you can find uh, an exception and check the code. So like if, the, if this error about the CPU capability false is uh, not telling you exactly what you want to know, then you know, check the code. Look for the exception. This was the exception for that uh, job that failed. And you, know, can, you can actually check the line numbers and stuff. So another solution is just to, to wait. Wait it out. There was a problem and uh, a virtual router took a, too long to reboot. It took a long time to reboot, right? So you can see job, you can find the job here, job 5473. And then submit the sequence at 1213. And then the sequence completed at 1241. So that's pretty long time. So what happened? Oh, right, yeah, successfully the job succeeded eventually, right? which is kind of painful, like 12.13 to 12.45 to shut down a virtual router, it's pretty long. Well, you can check the log. Well, you can find that this other job submitted at 11.30, <laughs> kicked off this sequence of uh, copying a template, and that, sequence, uh, that template copy took an hour, and this sequence here of the template copy basically conflicting with the sequence to shut down that virtual router. And so once, uh, once this uh, virtual router, um, when, once that template was deployed, that sequence could uh, continue and shut down the virtual router finally. And uh, so there's, I think there's been some improvements with here in this area because uh, it doesn't make sense to, for that to happen basically. Because you know, it's, just, it's just totally unrelated, right? So I think I have time for one more example. Uh, so this, in this case, there was a kind of a similar situation. They tried to destroy a router and it didn't work. So they hacked the database and it fixed it. So that's, you know, that's basically what they tell you, right? And so then you go through the log and find out basically what really happened, what's really going on, because database hacking doesn't actually help usually. 
So you can see that 905, they destroyed the VM, or tried to destroy the VM in 905, and then 944 basically succeeded, right? So wait a minute, they said they tried to do it and then didn't work, and then they hacked the database, and then it worked. But I'm looking at the log, and it worked. So then you check the log in a little bit more detail. And you can go to the agent.log of this host. So in the, in the sequence number, sequence 57 dash whatever, that's the, the 57 is the host ID. So you can log on to the host, host 57, check the agent.log. And hmm, wait a minute, when this is the sequence that was trying, CloudStack's trying to send this sequence to the host, is uh, unable to connect to remote. Hmm, it's bad, right? It's some kind of network problem, right? And then wait, oh, there's a sequence there 45 minutes later. And it succeeded. And so, so the original one, it worked. So it worked. So what happened? So if we go continue looking at logs, wait a minute, there's this 20 minutes after the first time, they, they, there's another destroy router. They tried again. So basically, they hacked the database, set the virtual router to stop state, and tried to destroy it again. You know, got the double facepalm moment right there. And so then we can see that this second attempt, the sequence of the new one, this, tool, this 807 sequence, is waiting for a sequence 800. So what was sequence 800? That was the sequence from the first attempt, the one that eventually worked, right? The new sequence doesn't get sent until the old one finished. And so this second attempt sequence gets sent at 944 and, wait a minute, storage volume not found, right? Because the first one succeeded, it deleted the volume. So that will be it. Uh, any Q&A? I think they are pretty much blown over the time. So um, any questions? Yeah. So in a production environment, do you think it's a good idea to run in debug mode? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on the uh, amount of entries. I mean, how? You know, if you have five gigs of entries per day, I mean, that's going to be a lot. So I've seen cases where they have just too many logs and they really do have to uh, uh, turn it off debug. Uh, because if, when, you have that many, when you have that much log files, then uh, the log rotation kind of can cause a lot of uh, utilization. You know, if you're gzipping five gigs you know, at midnight, it's going to kind of bog down the server a little bit. So it's just up to you. I mean, if you don't have debug, then if something happens, you cannot go back and find out what happened. Uh, if you're really concerned about that kind of thing, then you can do syslog. Send it somewhere else. Send those debug entries to some other server that can actually handle you know, five gigs a day of writes on the log files. Any other questions? OK, all right. <laughs>